Courtney and Monica. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you for having us. Go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully you all will see this data here. Go to slideshow mode. So I'm here to be here. Glad to be here today to talk about the gene disease validity SOP version 11 updates. And I'm giving this on behalf of the gene curation working group. Um, just spoiler alert, it's nothing huge, um, no scoring changes, but there is some additional guidance that you all may find helpful as we've heard, um, wanting to have some more details over specific items. It was released this past Tuesday or Monday, so you can access this on clinicalgenome.org by going underneath the curation activities, gene curation and training materials page. I will also pop this link right into the chat for you all so you can access it. Um, what you should know is that with this new release and the guidance, there will also be updates within the gene curation interface. So from um, soon this day on, you'll find when you go to do provisional approved and published curations, it will automatically go to SOP version 11. So just be aware of this. If you're doing curations and you need to backdate to a 10, you will have to adjust that. Um, the specific sections that we updated and I'll go by step by step are going to be our initial required components. We added some additional details in the defining the disease entity section, evidence collection, scoring genetic evidence at the case level data. Um, we'll also have segregation and simplified log scores and a new part of Appendix A, which I'll go over and review how you can use Genome Connect data for gene curations. And so for the first element in required components, we did provide a little bit more guidance and recommendations on the use of preprints. We want to recognize that there is a trial going on with NLM where preprints from BioArchive and MedArchive have a PMID. However, this is a trial period. We don't know how long this is going to last and it can bring up some inconsistencies or potential duplication of work when you have a preprint and then when it's finally published. So we did want to indicate for you, we find this very important for some groups to have these pre-publication articles um, yeah. to use for curations. Oh, can everyone mute, please? Thank you. Um, but if you do decide in your group to use a preprint, we would ask for you not to use that trial PMID, but instead outline that evidence and your evidence summary at the end. If it comes to needing to change or adjust a classification based on points to use your modified classification and provide the rationale. We are working on finding ways to use preprints um, and developing additional guidance for this use and having to use a stable ID. Um, so if there's any questions, again, consult your gene curation expert panel on the use of preprints and look into this guidance in the SOP version 11. Another part we wanted to highlight um, that we did last year is that we now have a nicer integration between the gene tracker and the gene curation interface. And so we've gotten many questions about access and the use of the gene tracker and its policy. So we just want to remind you that right now access to the gene tracker and that system must be confirmed and approved by your GSEP coordinator. And it's on an ad needed basis, dependent on your GSEP. So some GSEPs, all bio curators have access. Others, the coordinator of the GSEP may take care of the pre-curation. You really want to talk to your gene curation expert panel coordinator to make sure what access is needed for you. So again, consult those individuals. If you know that you're supposed to get access, then please email clengentrackerhelp at unc.edu and CC your GSEP coordinator for that confirmation. Within the next section of defining the disease entity, we did want to indicate because we have this gene tracker and GCI integration, and it is extremely important for us to capture that pre-curation information and those omen phenotypes that correspond with your final Mondo ID for your gene disease validity curation, that it's critical that you have to fill out all pre-curation records. Those are published to the website. They are part of that gene curation, and it's exceedingly important to provide the information um, of that most accurate representation of your curation. Also remember that we do use Mondo identifiers. So all of our gene disease mode of inheritance records, which we call a GDM, require the use of that monarch disease ontology identifier. We understand that there may not always be one that's accurate or appropriate and that you have different directions on what you need to do to contact Mondo. 
Um, when that's the case, we can say you can create and update it. We've provided directions both in the SOP, but also I wanna point out to you to the GSEP protocol, specifically in section 4.5. So you can go get some extra information on how you would go about contacting Mondo to go ahead and ask them to either update or create new IDs. Um, you do need that final Mondo ID to be in the gene tracker and then the gene curation interface in order to create that record and have it published. We recognize there's a free text section that really is just a hold when you are waiting to get a Mondo ID. You cannot use that for the GCI and it cannot be published to the website. So you absolutely need an ID. If you need any more recommendations about the use of Mondo, especially if it comes to updating disease names, and or their definitions, you can look at the Disease Naming Advisory Committee's website. They have all of the new um, guidance that we published last year. The paper was just published on the 5th of September. So I encourage you to read that and look at that additional information. So again, within our SOP version 11, under defining the disease entity section, you'll get more information. And also within our GSEP protocol, version two is about to be published by the end of the week. So one of the really big exciting things that we have to share with you all is that in addition to using a PMID to be able to catalog evidence and score it for gene curations, you now have the ability to use a ClinVar SCV submission ID. Um, this now allows us to support additional types of information that are published to the public that don't have an art, aren't a full article or have a PubMed um, identifier and able to do this. So I do want to let you know, we're going to have more information provided by Monica later on. Um, I'm actually going to review how you can use Genome Connect data that uses ClinVar IDs and SCVs. Essentially to do that, um, Caitlin unfortunately couldn't be here today, but she also created a nice video. We'll give you that link. Um, we'll give you guidance within the SOP on the use and documenting of these preprints as well. So again, you can use these SCVs. Um, we'll show you how to do that a little bit later. Um, definitely talk with your GSEPs on where they feel comfortable and the amount of evidence for that. Equally, when we think about using preprints, again, do not use the PMIDs as we discussed from those preprints. Document that in your evidence summary and make those adjusted classification changes. Um, as I mentioned, developments underway for these preprints in the GCI. So um, certainly if you have any questions, we can wait to the end to take them, but very exciting news for those of you that have additional information. Again, this is really important and I'll review our own ClinGen Genome Connect publishes um, different patient information that they collect to ClinVar through these SCVs. So it's a really rich way to use that data. Within the evidence collection and um, area and also within the GSEP protocol, we're adding guidance about developing what we are calling a GSEP scoring recommendation document. Um, again, this is not a required process, but highly encouraged for all groups, especially because it can help maintain consistency of scoring adjustments across curations and also across curators in a GSEP. Much like you can think of, there are um, criteria to think of variant pathogenicity. This is really looking at each different type of evidence collection and saying maybe when you want to use default, when you would increase the score, when you would decrease that score. Um, many uh, groups have lots of bio curators or extensive gene lists. So being able to create this kind of document can help improve that consistency. Um, here's an example of in the GSEP protocol where you can get more details. Uh, within the GSEP protocol, we are giving you access to a folder that has some example GSEP recommendation, scoring recommendation documents. You're gonna see a variety of how they've been able to use those. It's just a way for you to see what could be useful for your particular group. There's also a link to a template as well. If you wanna take that, it's basically showing each piece of evidence like case control, segregation, case level data, even into experimental, and you can talk about what are cutoffs for you to score or not score, what are animal um, model organisms that are useful for your group or ones you actually want to exclude because they're not good um, models of your particular phenotype. We also heard feedback from you all um, of wanting a little bit more clarity about some case level data evidence. So we've provided some clarification to indicate the need for curators and experts, the whole GSEP or expert panel to assess any and all evidence for its relevance to the curation. 
We acknowledge that many of the papers you're reading, there are going to be assertions about pathogenicity of variants um, and a gene for a specific phenotype, but it really is um, your responsibility as a curator and expert panel to look through that evidence to make sure does it fit the current gene curation um, gene disease validity SOP framework, or even your own GCEP scoring recommendations and how you would score that. Again, adjusting whether it's default, up score, down score, or no score at all. So when in doubt about anything that you're about to score, please consult your GCEP um, and expert panel. That's the best way to get the guidance about how they're feeling comfortable as a group um, and applying that information. We've also added a description of our new GCI phasing information for biallelic variants. Um, we will have some systematic and detailed structure where you can say, yes, phasing is confirmed. Um, it has not been confirmed or it's just unknown. Um, that's to be a little bit more transparent about the data that we have on this. And Monica will discuss a little bit more specifically in the GCI, how you will go about indicating that information um, on case level data. We also wanted to provide some guidance for you all about documenting putative loss of function versus other variant types. Um, this is a really big question that comes up. What happens when you have a missense variant that's functioning like a loss of function? How do you categorize this? It's really important when we think about the scoring, not only default, but the range of scores that we can apply to that specific um, level of evidence. So our guidance right now is for missense variants, it's recommended to always document them as other variant with gene impact. That is just indicating that that is a variant that's an other. It's not a nonsense, a frame shift. It is a missense variation. What we want you to understand is that the range of scores for the other variant type can be adjusted all the way up to 1.5, which is the default for loss of function. So if you have functional evidence to support that a missense variant um, reduces or completely obliterates the function, right, of a protein that it acts as a loss of function genetically, then you can score it up to that particular range. You don't need to adjust putting it in loss of function in order to get that score. Equally for putative null variants. So if you're seeing a variant that is indicating it's a nonsense or a frame shift, what we would look at and think, oh, this should be a null, but there's evidence to suggest it doesn't result in that complete absence or reduced. Maybe it's in the last exon. So the protein is produced, but it is perturbed in its function. Um, or again, we don't have any loss of function, go ahead and put it in predicted and proven null again. That's what it looks like um, based on its nomenclature, but adjust that score and talk with your expert panel. Why it can start as a default at 1.5, you can score this all the way down to zero, 0 0.1 points. So again, use that range of scoring points to be able to show the level and confidence you have in that particular variant based on the evidence. Make sure though, when you have adjusted these scores, this will require you to indicate your reason for the change score. So document that, say that evidence shows that it's still made and that there is some reduced function, but it's not completely absent or vice versa. So go ahead and use that free text box. All of that is published to the ClinGen website on your final gene disease validity curation. And so that makes it transparent for everyone who's seen it, why you've reduced that score from default and will give the information about um, how that particular variant is acting. So we wanted to highlight and indicate and acknowledge one of those words or all of those words that there are times um, in our particular calculation of what we call an estimated LOD or ELOD um, that we will get a lower than expected number of points um, than what you would get if you did the calculation yourself. Um, we do our best to have a calculation of the lot. It is outlined in the SOP, but we certainly acknowledge there are times where if you combine two pieces of data, you're going to get a lower lot score than if you had one of those pieces of data alone. Just be cognizant of this. Um, look at that with your group, make those additional calculations. And remember, you always have the ability to decide what data should include and exclude. So if you know that having a WES will get you a LOD score or two points and putting in some other type of segregation for a family, that will bring it down to one because it was not WES, it was, you know, Singer sequencing of one then just catalog that information, but don't add it to the full score. That will help to adjust. 
If in any doubt you've changed and altered this segregation to the point that is changing your classification, you can always modify your classification and provide the rationale. Um, we do our best to make sure we can accommodate many different things, but as you know, lot scores can be tricky in how we're going to calculate them. So just acknowledging this, having you all take a second look and just double check that you have your lot scores and the way it's calculating appropriate and that you're able to adjust your calculations for what you'd include and exclude. The other thing we just want to talk about is we had some minor wording changes, just like anything else, we wanted to um, provide some clarifications. Um, the other really nice thing that I will go through in the subsequent slides here is um, that we now in Appendix A contain information on how to use the ClinGen Genome Connect cases um, and their ClinVar entries and how to access them from clinicalgenome.org. I'm going to pop in a few different um, links here. So we did talk about the GSET protocol before I go through. And I see that Marina already put in the overview for how to look at Genome Connect. There's a really awesome YouTube video as well. I have the link at the end of these slides and it's popped into your chat. But for this exciting new feature that we have, if you go to clinicalgenome.org and you search in for a gene or your gene of interest, um, I happen to pick ASXL3 here, but again, let's search for any gene. Once you hit that page to look through, you can see if there's um, on the page Genome Connect here will show up with a bubble to tell you how many variants are present. So this is a really great way if you're trying to look at any information about this, um, you can access it really quickly from the Genome Connect or from the clinicalgenome.org website. Um, once you click on this tab, it will open up and let you know a little bit more information about Genome Connect. It gives you a nice um, email here, which is at the end of this particular slideshow too, if you have any questions, but it will tell you how many ClinVar submissions are currently there for that gene and the link to access them. So this is really great. It takes you right to that page of Genome Connect with your gene and you'll have the full list of that information. For this particular top um, entry, if we were to click on it to go in, if we scroll down, we can look directly in the Genome Connect entry, expand it, and you can see all of the information that is provided. So if this is important for you all to collect this information and use for your gene disease validity classification, you can see that you can get features that could be related to HPO terms here. You can also have the variant, right? That SCV number that you need to use to incorporate it, and then other testing information that is provided. Um, so definitely think about using this, checking this all the time if you're doing specific gene disease validity curations, whether or not there are some additional cases that you can um, indicate and use within your gene disease validity curation. Again, if you have any questions about this, there's also a really nice video on how to use this feature more. Um, obviously, you can access a lot of the Genome Connect um, ClinVar submissions from looking at them as the submitter through ClinVar, but this is a really nice way just to use our website and figure out that information really quickly. And that's it for my part. Before we go on to Monica, I'm happy to take any questions, but I think maybe we'll wait till the end when Monica reviews things because you might get some more clear questions on how some of these updates um, have been implemented in the gene curation interface. So I will leave it over to you, Monica. Thank you, Courtney. Um, my connectivity has been a little bit spotty, so I'm not going to share myself on video to hope that we don't have any lags. Um, but just please confirm for me that you can hear me fine and you can see the slides okay. Yes, I can. Wonderful. Yep, you sound good. Great. So uh, thank you everyone for joining today. I'm part of the Stanford ClinGen development team and I have a few GCI updates to go over with you today. And um, I'm going to focus on three in particular that have either just been released or who will, or which will be released um, in short order this month. And I'll also throw in a reminder about preprints that Courtney alluded to as well. So the first big thing we want to share is our newly released feature for supporting ClinVar submissions in the GCI. And this is using uh, VCVs and SCVs. So I'm going to give a little bit of background in case you aren't familiar with um, ClinVar VCVs and SCVs. Um, but you can now enter a VCV in the, G the GCI to retrieve a particular record. 
So VCV is the accession in ClinVar of aggregated data from all the submitted records for classifications of the same variant. And these are versioned. So the number after the period in a VCV um, tells you the particular version of that accession. And so the VCV, including the version number, can be found on the variant details section um, of a variance ClinVar accession in the subsection identifiers next to the ClinVar variation ID. So you want to start by grabbing this version VCV ID and putting that into the GCI. Um, that will take you to a specific page with all the submissions from different submitters, and each submitter has their own SCV, which is a separate identifier. So as I said, a VCV will take you to a specific accession page in ClinVar that lists all the submissions. Each group has its own SCV. The SCV is the accession assigned to a specific submitted record. And if you submit a query to ClinVar based on that SCV, it'll take you back to the VCV page. <laughs> because they don't store um, submission records on their own URL. They're all um, aggregated together. But the SCV accession number and version are displayed in the submissions section of the ClinVar accession page. Um, and you can see that they are also versioned. And so um, when you go to the GCI, you can enter that full SCV, including the version number, and retrieve a particular record. So I'm going to walk you through what that looks like. But just to reiterate again, the VCV is the variation ClinVar record that's up here in the varying details. The SCV is the submitted record in ClinVar ID that's down here, and each submitter has their own. Um, both of these records are versioned. Only one has its own page in ClinVar. Um, so you really need both of them uh, to be as specific as possible when you're curating this information. So what does this mean for curation? So now we can use both PubMed and ClinVar evidence sources um, in the GCI. If you click on the add button, that'll open a selection panel for retrieving and adding evidence. There are tool tips that explain what each evidence source type is and examples of each identifier uh, are shown in suggestive gray text so that you know what the proper format is for searching for this evidence. And then you'll have um, both evidence sources reflected in the evidence source column on your gene curation landing page. So step one, click this add button. That's gonna open a new pop-up. Step two, enter the versioned VCV ID in this top field. Once entered, that's instantly gonna generate a link to view that record in ClinVar. And then you can enter the specific submitter ID or SCV ID from that record. And then you wanna click retrieve evidence source. That's gonna show you a preview of the submission record associated with that SCV. And if it's the one you really want and you're sure, then you can click Add Evidence Source to add that entry to the GCI. And then once you've done that, what you'll see is any comments from that ClinVar submission will appear in the central panel, which is the region where we normally have things like paper citations and abstracts. Um, and that evidence can now be scored and added as usual. So if there's Individual evidence for a clinical observation in ClinVar, you can add it from this ClinVar submission and score it. Um, I doubt there will be a lot of experimental evidence in ClinVar right now, but that may be a potential thing you will want to score in the future. And you could do so. I will note, though, if you have a, a ClinVar submission that cites functional evidence from a paper, please just cite the published paper for that functional evidence. We want to cite primary sources uh, wherever possible. Um, but yeah, so if you add your ClinVar submission to the GCI, this is what it will look like. And um, this is the breakdown for the evidence we retrieve from ClinVar for submissions. So we'll have the submitter name, the variant in question related to that submission, the date it was updated, and the version. And then the identifier um, will be the SCV ID with the version number. Um, with the VCV ID in parentheses, because again, we can't link out to a specific submitter page, but we can link out to the parent page with all of those submissions. So combine the SCV, VCV links to ClinVar, PMID is still linked to PubMed. Both of these evidence sources will appear in the preview evidence summary. So ClinVar submissions will use SCVs linked to the VCV record. This is how they'll appear in the preview evidence summary. Published papers will still use their pub links to PubMed. And both evidence sources can appear in the classification summary and can be cited under replication over time. So for replication over time, what will be cited in the um, classification summary will be the versioned SCV ID and the year. 
And last but not least, thanks to some uh, heroic work <laughs> by our other collaborators, these ClinVar submissions, uh, if they're cited in the GCI record, will also appear um, on the ClinGen website. So um, both scorable and non-scorable ClinVar evidence will be uh, published and viewable there as well. It will also include the SCV version ID, linking to the VCV page. It'll include the submitter name, the variant in question, and the date uh, that it was updated. And then any um, explanation for why you include an individual will also be published. So for example, for this particular published curation, uh, it was considered non-scorable evidence because the affection status and zygosity of this person uh, was not reported. Uh, but there was an observation reported in ClinVarf, um, and so it was included for that reason. If you want more detailed guidance on how to use this new feature, I've included a URL link to our help documentation. Um, and I'm happy to also answer any questions about that at the end. But in the interest of time, I wanna move on to the next feature that we're going to be talking about today. And that is uh, recording phase status in the GCI. This feature is planned to be released later today. So this is very much hot off the press. So uh, in accordance with the new uh, guidelines in the uh, SOP version 11, scoring probands for autosomal recessive conditions now requires um, curators to specify the phase status of those observations. And when you're entering biallelic variants in the GCI, you'll now have to check a box to attest if the variants are either homozygous or proven or suspected in trans. Uh, I will note that there's no option for variants in cis because two variants in cis would not be informative for an AR curation. If you select um, this first option, which is that variants are proven or suspected in trans, you will um, have a second set of boxes appear so you can specify further which case uh, you're actually curating. So the variants are proven in trans, you select the first bullets, suspected in trans second, or unknown is the third. If you select proven in trans or suspected in trans, then two variant names have to be provided in order to score that evidence. Otherwise, the record won't save and will produce the following error. Two variants in trans selected, please provide two variants. Once you've entered two variants and you score them, then you can save the record. And I will note that at present, um, phase uh, for a maximum of two variants is supported at this time. Phasing of three or more variants is not supported. That's not a use case that we've encountered yet. Uh, that's a problem for a future date. Um, if phase unknown is selected, you can still enter the variants observed and save them, but you won't have an option to score them. Um, and this is because um, they're, they're not considered <laughs> scoreful evidence. And so they won't appear in the preview evidence score tab, nor in the classification summary scoring matrix. Because of that, we instead encourage uh, you to capture this information in the non-scorable evidence section um, in Curation Central in this um, central column. So um, you can put the reason why you know phase is unknown and why you're not scoring there. And then lastly, phase status will be viewable in the preview evidence uh, table under the new uh, column called phase status. And so, um, That'll just be linked to whichever proband uh, evidence is being curated. And I've also want to share a couple of examples of what we mean uh, for these different options. So when we say proven in trans, what we mean is that each parent of the proband has been confirmed to be heterozygous for each respective variant, or that there is available sequence data showing that the variants are close enough to capture phase based on available reads. So here you have a deletion and a um, single nucleotide variant. They're on the same read. They never occur together. Therefore, you can uh, conclude that those variants are proven in trans. For suspected in trans, what we mean is that phase can be inferred based on one parent's genotype and or certain sibling genotypes. So for example, let's say uh, we had only genotyped this proband's mother, right? and they had one variant, but the proband had both, and you could deduce that those variants are likely in trans in that proband. Or let's say that um, the proband sibling was genotyped and found to be heterozygous, but for only one of those variants, you could deduce that they probably inherited that from the other parent, and so those are likely in trans or suspected in trans. When we say phase unknown, we mean that we cannot infer phase as no genotypes have been provided other than the probands. We don't have parental genotype data or any other sibling data. 
The other way that you can establish that phase is unknown is that you have sequence data that is not informative, meaning that there are no reads long enough to span both variants because they're too far apart. So here's one variant, here's another variant. There is no single read spanning both of them. Um, and so phase is unknown. Now, we instituted some logic for assigning phase status for new and historical individuals. And so the process for um, a new proband is you'll have to provide the variants, those will be scored, that zygosity will be recorded, and the phase status is manually selected by the curator. For historical records where the proband um, appears after SOP8, um, we'll default phase status to proven. For uh, historical probands pre SOP8, um, default phase status will be unknown. For historical records that have only one variant, um, we'll default the, the zygosity to homozygous. For non proband individuals, um, they'll have two variants. Zygosity will be two trans, phase status will be manually selected by the curator. Um, for historical pre SOP8 variants, um, default will be two trans, phase status will default to unknown. Now, I want to stress that these phase options won't affect the scores of historical records um, until the user makes a selection. So nothing about a historical record is being updated. It will stay the same. However, if you reopen a historical record, you will be required to specify phase for any individuals under that record and will suggest a default status based on the logic outlined above. You can always change it once you open the record. Um, and then if you want some guidance for this new feature, here's a link to the help documentation for phase status. Um, and I will move on to last but not least, a feature that we're very excited to be uh, releasing later this month, and that is editing published summaries in the GCI. This was a um, highly ranked and oft requested feature. And um, thanks to our wonderful developers, we uh, found a way to implement this for you. So I wanna start by just defining a couple of different things, right? So when I say things like published summary, I'm referring to key pieces of information from the classification that get published to the ClinGen website. So things like the approval date, the date the curation was initially published, what the submitter name is, the reason for the curation, who approved the curation, any secondary contributors or provers, the evidence summary itself. And so um, a subset of these fields, the ones that have an asterisk, those will be editable via a new edit publish summary button. And this button is for administrative edits only. This feature is not intended for uh, changing evidence in a curation. It's meant for things like typos. Um, the other term I wanna define clearly is evidence summary. So this is the free text field that curators use to summarize the evidence on gene disease relationships. Um, it is a subset of this published summary. And this is the most common reason why curators want to be able to edit this feature. So um, this is where you write the text description of all the information that you've curated. The other thing I wanna define is the view published edits history link. This is a new link that's going to appear in the GCI. Um, and it only appears once edits to the published summary have been made. And clicking this link will open a new tab with a history of all the administrative edits um, compared to its prior version. If no edits have been made to the published summary, this link will not appear. Okay, so that being said, I'll walk you through how to use this new feature. So start with your gene disease mode of inheritance, click on view classification summary, and then that um, will take you to um, the following page where you can view uh, current approved classifications. Um, if you hit this edit publish summary button, that will let you edit the published summary. And then you can make select edits in the um, selection panel that opens after that. So any fields that are in white can be edited. Any fields that are on a gray grayed out field cannot be edited. So you can update the approval review date if you want. You can update any secondary contributors to that particular curation. You can add a secondary approver if there was one. Um, and you can also update the evidence summary itself by clicking on this pencil icon here. Um, things that you cannot change. So who submitted the record originally will not change. The reason for the curation 
is not optional. It will always be administrative update for error and or clarification. Um, and then the published date will refresh automatically. We don't want that to be manually altered. So once you've added or removed um, any of these editable features, you can then check this confirmation box and then click Save and Republish. That will republish the summary to the website and that will close this selection panel. So now after saving and republishing, um, the approved section will retain the name of the original submitter, the original date that it was saved as approved, um, and the published section will show the name of the person who edited the summary, the date and time that their edits were saved and republished, the name of the most recent editor, um, and the curation reason, which will always be administrative update error classification. If you want to view any prior edits or just compare the, the changes that were made, you can click on this new View Published Edits History link, and that'll take you to a new tab with side-by-side -side comparisons of the current published summary and its pre, uh, previous version. So clicking that view edit history link will open this new tab. Um, the before fields in gray are gonna be on the left. The after fields are going to be in right on the right in blue. And the history is sorted in reverse order. So the most recent edits to the published summary will appear at the top of the tab and then you can scroll down to view more historical or older edits. Any text that was removed from the prior evidence summary is gonna be highlighted in red on the before side. Any text added to the republished evidence summary is gonna be highlighted in green on the after side. Um, and the other fields, they are still editable, but they won't, they won't be highlighted. But for example, you could see in this um, example, a third contributor was added during the last edit. That's why there's an additional um, affiliation ID there. And this view is available for every edit made um, in the GCI. Um, if text is replaced between published events, that's also going to be highlighted. So here, for example, um, again, red highlights what's removed from the before, green highlights what's added to the after, and then what is swapped is what's highlighted here. So for example, um, the user swapped a comma for a period, they capitalized the word the, they swapped the word which with these. So all of those changes are gonna be captured. If you want some additional step-by-step -step guidance on how to use the edits published summary feature, uh, this is the link for, for that guidance and our help documentation. And then the last thing I have is um, just a preprint reminder, as Courtney mentioned, um, we really recommend using peer-reviewed published articles as evidence wherever possible. In cases where preprint data might be relevant, please discuss that with your GSEB first. Um, we note that preprint data is an extremely rare use case and is subject to GSEB discretion. And if you have preprint data that is deemed clinically relevant for curation, if it's scorable, just mention it in the evidence summary and manually adjust the classification. If it's non-scorable, please don't include it in the evidence summary. Um, and then, Again, please don't add preprint PMIDs to the GCI, only add PMIDs that belong to published articles, and you can review this policy in our help documentation as well. Um, I really wanna thank everyone who's put a lot of effort into these new features. It's been a very busy year for us. Um, I especially wanna thank Gloria Chung and Mark Mandel, who are software developers at Stanford, who made these uh, features happen. Uh, Mark Wright was instrumental in all of those discussions. Matt Wright was instrumental in all of those discussions as well. Um, I also wanna thank the Gene Curation Core Group for all of their feedback, as well as Tristan Nelson and Phil Weller. Um, and if you have questions, you can always email our help desk, gciclinicalgenome.org. And again, there's a view to our help documentation at the bottom. So um, with that, I will take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Courtney and Monica. This has been a wonderful update of all the exciting new features. So I know we have a couple questions in the chat. So maybe we can start with that. Um, so Lucy had a question in the chat for unknown phase variants. Should we still enter the variant details or just refer them in general to the description of the PubMed ID entry? Um, so I think that we are saying in general for if you do not have know the phase and the variants, you can add that as non-scorable evidence. Um, and that I think that is a description just a mm -hmm. general description. I don't think we're able to enter in the specific variants in that case, that's correct. I you think. could enter them, but they won't be scorable and they won't show up in the matrix. So it's it's uh -huh. really 
it's better to just include them in the non-scorable evidence description. Yeah, and then just yeah. detail like which variants those are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or at least which case, what's the name of it. Okay. Um, if anyone else wants to unmute, raise their hands, um, ask questions in the chat, I will um, stick another question out there just to remind everyone of like um, kind of gene curation's policies now that we actually are able to enter ClinVar uh, variants into the GCI. Uh, Courtney, can you give some thoughts about when it's appropriate to score ClinVar entries in gene curations? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously it does come back to your gene curation expert panel and what they want to accept, but we have to realize that a lot of ClinVar entries can have lots of data or none, right? And so really when we think about gene disease validity for us to have any kind of um, strength of evidence to score, we really need to understand the phenotypes of the individual with the variant and the very least that they have the disease or phenotype that we're actually attributing to it. So those are things to look out for when you're coming into these ClinVar records. Are they at least telling us a little bit about what was the disease that was diagnosed? What are those phenotypes that are included with that? It can be nice if there are functional evidence included, but as we say, that might be, you need to go look at that functional evidence, look at it to see, does it really support based on our framework? And if it does, then go ahead and cite that for reasons why you're changing the score. The one thing, just like we were saying, an entry may tell you pathogenic. That's really for your group to establish, right? We don't know if they're using specific framework, even if it's ACMG or not. So it's really what kind of evidence can you accumulate about that variant to make you feel comfortable? If it's a missense and you have nothing, you're at 0 0.1, right? Um, so that will be a little bit of those touch points. You still wanna think about the type of evidence your group considers to be a strong level of evidence, just like you would in a PubMed ID and that ClinVar ID or ClinVar entry, I should say. <laughs> Thanks, Courtney, that's helpful. And I will also echo from like the variant curation standpoint that at least in variant curation, we know that many um, expert panels have submitters or I'm um, sorry, have experts from in, in clinical labs that can give you this internal data that would potentially make you feel comfortable um, counting a ClinVar submission. Just to keep in mind, please never put any um, PHI in any of your descriptions of ClinVar entries in, in either the gene curation or the variant curation interface, because any of that would be published and publicly available. But you can definitely reach out to like clinical labs. They've always been very amenable when I reach out to get additional information about cases. Just be careful when you're detailing any of that in the curation. And I want to add, this is another way for you all, not only within ClinGen, but within your own professional lives or personal lives, just to tell people, hey, we can utilize ClinVar entries even more now past variants. So please, please, if you don't have the time or the ability to publish a whole manuscript, we know that's a lot of time. Would your institutions or places be able to publish this information to ClinVar? And again, if you can include some things about the phenotype as best you can without that PHI, that's where we know it will be really highly used um, across our ClinGen curation activities. I did want to point Marina to one question that came into the chat that I answered. So it was from Erica. So thank you, Erica, for this. It said, what is the preferred method to edit an existing evidence summary if I have to make significant updates due to recuration with new evidence? So not administrative error. It's a really great question. When we're talking about this evidence summary that Monica went out, it really is. Do you have a typo? <laughs> Did you forget to put a secondary contributor to it? Or do you have a new secondary contributor? Nothing's changing about the data you scored. Nothing's changing about the experimental evidence you included. It's just the fact that another group was interested in this gene, wanted to add a little bit of a sentence. That's when you use this feature. If you need to go through a full recreation and you're saying, I really am reevaluating this. I've looked to see if there's new evidence. If there is, I've added it. If there's not, I haven't, but I need a new approval date. You have to go through the full curation procedure. Go on the GCI to that record, go through to update any scoring as appropriate, go to save a new provisional approved and published and update that approval summary. You will then be asked what's the reason for this curation. Please choose recuration. 
Also, you can manually update for those of you that are bio curators within your specific gene tracker record, but this is for all of you that are coordinators on this call. You can indicate you're doing a recuration there and manually upload that date. Again, that's going to help us with the versioning of these records. So that was a really great question. Thank you for asking it, Erica. I think we and have just another... for access to slides, yeah. I gave them to Kazan, so she'll have mine to send out afterwards. Perfect. And it sounds like Monica is also putting her. So we should have those slides and then the recording. I think we have another question from Lucy, potentially related to like the GSEP, um, the specific GSEP SOPs that you had um, mentioned, Courtney. Is there a standard point adjustment increment scale we should use when adjusting evidence scores from default, or is it different based on individual GSEPs and VSEP considerations? That's a really good question. At this point, it can be different based on GSEPs. We're asking all of them. You can't change the the diff, like range. Like that can't happen, right? We're always going to have a range for other of zero to one point five is the max, right? For loss of function, um, predicted proven null, it's going to be from zero up to three. Those won't change. But individually within your group, you have to think about what's the type of genotyping method that you find most acceptable. What's the previous testing you want, right? For those of you that have GSEPs with extensive gene lists, right, um, we can think about maybe retinal dystrophy, right? There's hundreds of genes that can cause this same phenotype. It might be really useful to say, here are the genes that cause are the most prevalent, right? These need to be ruled out when we're thinking of others. If they aren't, reduce the score by half or a 0.5. So that's where these groups can come in to say, Based on the evidence of what we have, here's where we would say to downscore. Here's where we'd say to upscore. So it is a little bit individual. What's nice about it, as we said, it can give consistency when you do have gene list of 30, 50, 100, 200 genes. It becomes really hard to remember how you upscored and downscored. So for those groups that have those long gene lists, they've been doing these recommendation documents to really keep them on track. And also, um, because it can be an extensive time and you may have new bio curators that come in. It's a really nice document to hand and say, look, here's the expectation on top of this SOP of how we would score. Um, we've heard from many groups that do this. It helps to support those new bio curators um, to understand that. And what's nice is you have, if you do a paper, there's your materials and methods. You've already wrote about what you've done, how you've done it. It's consistent there. Um, so Really great question. Again, it does allow groups to have a little bit more flexibility, but nobody can rewrite the type of scoring. It has to be within the SOP framework. Otherwise, we cannot adjust anything to the GCI past that. Great. Thanks, Brittany. Um, is there guidance on scoring based of clonvar submissions? For example, a het nonsense variant would we want to be more conservative than the one and a half default or would just be a judgment call by the GSEP? Yeah, that's a great question, Pam. At this point, we are giving that as a judgment call based on the GSEP. Again, how comfortable you're feeling about the data that's been provided for that specific ClinVar entry. So if you're seeing, oh, it's a variant and they were diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that might not be enough for your group. Maybe it is. For other groups that are more syndromic, you may want to have a list of phenotypes or features. And so you can always gauge your confidence level on how you want to score that data um, based on your GSEP and the amount of data they've provided and evidence in that um, specific entry. Yeah, I will also echo that I think, um, as usual, autosomal recessive um, gene disease relationships like have a, a little bit more difficulty there when using ClinVar records because you really need to confirm, like ClinVar is not a case level database. You really need yeah. to confirm if you have like a nonsense variant associated with an autosomal recessive condition that has in fact been observed in a biallelic case with the right. condition. So definitely keep that in mind too. Yeah, because many of these that we're seeing put in to ClinVar are actually from carriers, right? So that exactly. might be yeah. where you need to reach out. And that's where for you all kind of thinking about who is the submitter that can often happen from some of the larger diagnostic companies. And it's great. They're writing out, here's the variants we observe, but go that extra mile to see, maybe talk to them. Are they saying if it was found um, by allelic or recessive and what might be that other variant?
Great, great questions. Any other ones before we let you go? Feel free to stick in the chat or on mute, raise your hand, anything. Okay, if not, I would really like to thank Courtney and Monica for coming on today and giving us all these updates, a very exciting new features. I'm particularly excited about the Clinvar entries one. Um, and I hope if you have any questions, you know, we have all these documents here and the resources and um, recordings will be circulated in the slides after this, but um, feel free to reach out to the Gene Curation Small Group um, or any of the folks on this call and we can, um, you know, help you with those questions. And I put the gene curation email in oh, yes, and the SOP you, and everywhere else mm -hmm. that definitely the whole gene curation small group mediates that or um, gets those emails. So please feel free at any time you have questions to email us. We're happy to um, respond. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. We'll give you a few minutes back and talk to you in a couple of weeks. Bye. Bye.